Good evening, everybody. Come join us tonight. We're just going to lift up his name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You never know what might happen in the presence of our Savior. When we lift up his name and praise him, he inhabits our praises. So he's already in the room. So let's join him.
music keeps shutting off. I'm not sure what's happening. Marino Florida on that keyboard. Never knew death could be so sweet. I never knew surrender could feel so free. I've never seen such a meekness and majesty. But the blood of Jesus was bled for me. And now I sing freedom for all of my days. It's only by the power of the cross. The King of glory rescued me And now beautiful the blood flows How merciful the love shows The King of glory poured out Victorious are we
tiempo Precio Señor Think about what he's done for you about the fact that if he never does another thing, he's already done enough. He went to the cross in my place. And he rose from the dead. He proved to us that there's everlasting life. your 
get your glory in me and I'll serve anywhere just let me see your beauty so put me anywhere just put your glory in me and I'll serve anywhere just let me see your beauty Just put your glory in me, 
Lord, that's our cry. Put me anywhere. Put me anywhere, God. Father, we cry out, God, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, that you would bring us anywhere, that we, our yes would be so big. Our yes would be so big that we would allow God to orchestrate our path, that we would allow him to direct our steps, that we would truly know that the Lord of God, of Yahweh God, is directing every step of our lives. And I've been reading Chuck Swindoll, Joseph. He has a biography on Joseph. And Joseph, we know we know he, he was thrown into the, to the pit from his brothers and he was taken away by the Ishmaelites and then he found favor with Pharaoh and then Pharaoh's wife lied and said he was he he was uh, making moves on her and then he found himself in the in the um, in the pit again once again and then the cupbearer and the all these people had dreams and he interpreted them and then he said don't forget me and then they forgot him and all these things happened and all these series of events happened in his life and then I was, just the other night I was reading when his brothers finally came when there was a famine and they had nowhere to go and they came for such a time as this and, the, and Joseph looked at them after they had repented and he said no God ordained me to be here God ordained my steps and I just believe that the Lord wants to ease your heart and your mind that your steps are ordered of the Lord and the things that you're going through and the stresses that you have and the temptations that are coming your way if you yield and you submit and you do not complain but you give your heart to the Lord and you say yes God whatever your will is for my life he will turn it all around for good he says that all things work together for good to so that those that love him and are called according to his purpose and we have to have a kingdom perspective we have to meditate on those things that are good that are right that are noble he meditated on his Abba dad he knew the God of Jacob and Isaac. He knew that his God would deliver him time and time again. He found Jesus faithful. And so I just want to submit to you, God is faithful wherever you're at in life. Continue to submit your life to the Lord. Continue to get under authority. Continue to have a covering. Continue to allow Abba Daddy to engage you. And he will direct your steps. And you will be able to look back and say, my God is the one who brought me to this place so tonight just engage with the Lord I just believe that God wants to ease some of your anxiety he wants to dispense um, vain imaginations and things that try to exalt themselves out of the knowledge of God so just just bring yourself to the altar if you have to tonight to be able to concentrate on the one thing you're here for and that is Jesus Thank you, God. We just thank you, Jesus, that you're here tonight to deliver, to set free, God, to set our paths, Lord Jesus, astray, Lord God, to make the crooked places right, Lord Jesus, and the rough road, and the rough road smooth, Lord Jesus. Father, we just ask, God, that you would just come and you would cleanse, God, and you'd purify and bring innocence and perspective, God, that where you have us, God, you are right where we're supposed to be. And if we're not, God, quickly, through repentance, God, you will make our way straight, Jesus. Father, we love you and we bless you, Jesus. So put me anywhere, just put your glory in me, and I'll serve anywhere, just let me see your beauty. So put me anywhere, just put your glory in me, and I'll serve anywhere, just let me see your beauty. So put me anywhere, just put your glory in me, and I'll serve anywhere. Just let me see your beauty, let me see your glory, God. Let me see your glory, God. So catch me up in your story all my life. Glory, catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Catch me up in your story all my life. My God, my joy, my delight. My God, my joy, my.
never want to know me without you. I've already known me without you. I never want to know me without you. Ever again. Ever again. You change. 
Just breathe Whatever you need Our God is in control There is rest here surely fine if you're thirsty the spirit in the bright say Just breathe. 
rest here in the arms of Christ And all in seek will surely find Let's declare it today If you're thirsty The Spirit and the Bride say really issuing an invitation to come and drink deeply tonight. He's inviting you to come. There's healing. There's mercy. There's freedom. It's for you tonight. There's more than enough. There's more than enough. There's more than enough. So I encourage you tonight. Don't just be a bystander. God's here. The God that opens blind eyes. The one who sets heroin addicts free. The one who raises the dead. He's here tonight. He's here tonight, and he wants to encounter your heart. Just come. The Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And the thing is, some of you, you've dammed up the river. It's not flowing because of stuff that you've carried. It's time to lay it down, to remove those things that have dammed it up so the river can flow freely again. So Holy Spirit, have your way tonight. Have your way. You're invited to move, God. Do whatever you want to do. Lord, we, we choose to come and to encounter your heart. Lord, we don't want it just another good worship service. God, we want to encounter you. We want to go deep with you. We're hungry. We're thirsty. We long. We seek. We yearn. We desire for more of you, God. And I thank you, Lord, that you say if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we'll be filled, God. So fill your kids tonight, Jesus. Fill your kids tonight, Jesus. Lord, would you meet everyone? every need tonight. Increase hunger, God. Thank you, Lord. We're thirsty, God. We're thirsty, God. We're thirsty, God, for you. You're so good. You're so worthy. Just begin to declare it. Declare it out loud with your mouth. You're good, God. You're worthy, God. You're beautiful, Jesus. Oh, we Just breathe, go deep, let love teach you to fly, come
tonight all these songs deal with the peace of God and breaking chains and getting freedom stepping out into the waters and I'm wondering how many of you tonight are standing in your spot wherever you're seated or standing and you're saying I come every week and I and I keep hearing this and I have no idea what to do like I keep coming with the same chains and they're not going anywhere and you see other people maybe down here and they're praying and you're like, I don't, I don't know exactly what to do. And I think there are a couple things. One is that uh, the verse that kept running through my mind tonight is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. So it doesn't matter what that thing is that's on you. It could be a financial burden. It could be um, a some type of a habit or an addiction or some struggle in your life. It could be an emotional thing. It might be a relationship that is, is holding you captive, holding you even slave. But we have to seek God. That, the answer is seeking Him. And the, the transitions occur in our life and our heart when all we care about is seeking Him. And so we have to cry out to Jesus. You know, and it may be that you've never cried out for that first time. Maybe you've not asked him to come and, and save you and, and repented of your sin and said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord, and I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be a Christ follower. Because if you haven't done that, you're going to just struggle. And so that might be the first step. And you can come up here, and there are many of us that will be happy to pray with you and talk with you. But if you've done that and you're just walking in that struggle, I was thinking of something that, that I didn't realize, and God, like, showed me tonight this chain that just keeps, like, grabbing me again, you know, and how to, how to just, I've got to seek ye first the kingdom of God, and I have to seek him, and I have to seek his presence, and it has to start every day. It can't be at 10 at night. It's got to start in the morning, 
And it's got to be a continual seeking. And even here, there's so much going on that, guys, you got to just get here and you got to close your eyes and you have to seek Him. And, and then He does the work. He does the work and He will take things off you. But you got to let go, too. If you are holding on, He's not going to pull it away from you. You got to say, Jesus. You can have all of me. Show me what it is today. Because he can't take it all at once and kill us. Show me today what I need to let go of. What is the next level? What is the next peeling of the onion? What is the next layer that needs to come off? Because, guys, if we're going to change this community, it has to start with us. And it's awesome to come here and praise him and worship. And we get to do it in a fashion here you don't see in most churches. And we get to experience that. But it's got to be about more than that. If that's all you're coming for is just to get up here and and do all this and then you walk out the door, you've missed it. Because we have to go deeper. I want to walk in a place and people know that something has shifted in the atmosphere. And I don't want it to be me. I want it to be the glory we were singing about, that the glory of God is so present that people know when there's a shift and people know they can come up to you and say, can you pray for me? So I'm encouraging you right now, if there is something that you have struggled with over and over and over, or you have not accepted him the first time, on this next psalm, make your way down here. And there are plenty of leaders right down here. Just come down here to the front and someone will pray with you.
can just sense the anticipation in the atmosphere tonight just waiting for the word that God is going to release tonight are you here who's ready who's ready are you ready father we thank you Lord for the word that you're going to bring to your people tonight God we're anticipating God what you're going to bring tonight Lord we sit at your table tonight father that you would give us that bread God that you would give us that bread that comes from heaven, Father. That you would speak into our hearts. That you would speak into every desire, Lord. That, Lord, I declare hearts and minds open. Lord, I declare every heart here tonight fertile ground, God. So that when your word is just scattered, Lord, the, the seed of your word, God, would just land on fertile soil, God. That tonight, God, that you would produce, Lord, in abundance, Lord. Lord, that you would produce fruit in abundance here tonight, God. And every heart, Lord, every person here that's here tonight, God. Lord, I, 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 we give you freedom here tonight God we give you freedom to move Lord to move and do what you want father this is your this is your time Lord this is your time father we we give this time to you God to your word God we just thank you for what you're gonna do here tonight father in Jesus name I pray amen just touch somebody's shoulder just speak more God more more 
more, God. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Jesus. I just declare more over my friends. Yeah, love you. Jesus. I just want to stay in this all night. I totally could. Like, just... <laughs> This is why I love Wakaiwa so much. It's because we could just, three hours, yeah, look like, at this, just stay here. That's why I have a loop pedal. <laughs> yeah, I love you, John Skrisky. Do you appreciate the worship team tonight? I appreciate them. And our sound guys and everybody, just, so, just love you guys so much. Oh, Jesus. All right, so a couple quick things. We're going to dive into the word because I just feel, an, I really do feel an anticipation, Carrie, that God's, that's something that he wants to release to us. I'm really excited about that. Couple quick God reports. Sarah, come up real quick. God report. Okay, so today um, I ended up getting canceled at work, so I went and spent time with the Lord on the beach. And I was just like, oh, worship, worship. And then it was like, peace. And then I have to go to the dollar store. So I walk in the dollar store, and the Lord spoke to me how he speaks to me about some guy in front of me and how his left ankle was like injured or was sore or whatever and I asked him and he was like why are you a therapist and I'm like no I'm a prayer warrior so I I literally felt the presence of God as I knelt down and he was instantly healed in his ankle it was so cool oh and and the cashier got rocked by it too absolutely <laughs> Oh, yeah, that, yeah, no. So, um, yeah, the cashier was like, I just want you to know you made my day. I was having a really bad day, but because you did what you did and you listened to the Lord and you prayed right then, when he tells you to do something, do it now because you don't know who's watching, who's paying attention, and whose world's going to get rocked by it. It's really good. So good. So good. And Naya got an awesome answer to prayer. That you Just like in, in a 60 seconds, you want to share real quick? And I, I, to, to me, my heart is just rejoicing with her because we've walked through this journey with foster children and everything. And so. Yes, I've had a foster baby since she was 10 months old. Um, for in December, I was told that she would have to go to a man that was supposed to be her legal dad. Um, so it put me in a dark place. Believe it or not, at Wakaiwa, I was in my dark place because of that, and that's when God healed my eye. But as I come back... Um, it, everything shifted. There she is, my baby. So um, Friday, I got told, come here, Nana. Come to mommy. I can honestly say mommy because I went to court Friday morning. I went to court Friday morning, and at the end of court, technically what's supposed to happen was supposed to be a case plan. And I was like, oh, Jesus, no. I said, God, let your will be done. I left it to Jesus half an hour later. Half an hour later, I got a phone call from the caseworker that legal dad is signing all his rights over and allowing me to adopt her. So in my dark place, I still got Jesus and I got my baby. Yay, Jesus. <laughs> so good. Chris, two, can you do it in two minutes? Or you want to you save it for next week? Or you want to do it now? Okay. Well, I'm just really excited about the times that we're living in. Are you guys excited about that? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, reports like what we're hearing, I mean, they are happening all over the place. I mean, we saw a blind eye get healed. I mean, come on, right? Well, <laughs> you want me to say something about the Super Bowl? Okay, so... Well, number one, um, while I was worshiping tonight, um, I don't know if any of you guys were here a couple weeks ago when I was talking about a vision that the Lord gave me of being on a battlefield and being in prayer and being in peace. Well, today I actually saw an eagle come and scoop me up and float me above the war zone. And I had such peace. And I feel like what happened last night was very prophetic. Um, I'm not going to go super deep into it. Some people might even be overwhelmed by just a little bit of this, but um, there's only one church in the book of Revelation that gets only exhorted and not rebuked. Anybody know what the name of that church is? Philadelphia. Um, and so it actually says that that church 
because of what they've done, they've kept to the Lord, they've persevered, they'll be protected from the hour of testing. And then in Revelation 12, 14, it says that the woman who also represents the body of Christ, who also happens to represent Israel, is also going to be lifted up by an eagle and protected from the serpent, from the devourer, from the one that wants to consume her. Um, and that's us, by the way. Um, so I feel like that the Lord is releasing this grace, um, and it's a grace to trust him more than what we've trusted him before in the midst of the war zone, because there is going to be an hour of testing. But I really believe that an eagle has been released for us. And if we just latch on, man, we are going to soar. And we are going to see amazing things. We're going to rise up on wings like eagles, like Isaiah 40 says. Um, and Chuck, that was in your liturgy yesterday, randomly. Uh, nothing's random. Um, but, um, but God is up to something big. So if you are having trouble trusting him, please know you are in a special time and he's chosen you to be here right now and he has a plan for you that nobody else can fulfill but you and he's going to give you the grace to make it all happen perfectly according to schedule isn't that awesome amen amen oh and by the way are you, you want to show the video okay hey verlin um so this is this was kind of like one of the big confirmations of all of what i just said um, I came across this video on Saturday. Um, you got it? This is the Philadelphia Eagles. sports teams locker room and now they've been given this this amazing opportunity to be on an on an international stage and have all eyes drawn on them and they played fantastic and they won against the most hated team in the league right I mean how prophetic right the most hated of our enemies you know that nobody thinks we can beat but man when God's involved and he sends that eagle boy oh boy Man, nothing's impossible. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. No, I, but, I, but I will say this. I will say this. This was, I, I'm not a sports person at all, so, you know, whatever. But, but I, I'm on the air in New England, so I, I, so I have two radio stations I work for every day in New England, so that there's a lot of people mourning there right now. But, um, but there, there, there have been... Um, some real prophetic words by, by prophets that I trust about, about this. This is a, a, an act of just saying what the Lord is releasing right now. So just watch, okay? Just to take, you know, hide it in your heart, see what the Lord is saying. As, I, it has nothing to do with football, I believe, but it has to do with proclaiming the name of Jesus and, and the harvest that's coming and what God is doing right now. And so look for opportunities that he gives you in the places that you go just to be light and love and, and see the doors that he opens for you and let the Holy Spirit speak through you life to the people around you. Amen? Okay, we're going to do that together. And, and a couple ways we want to help you do that is by equipping you. So real quickly, this weekend, uh, the last day to register, I think, is Tuesday, tomorrow. Um, but we have um, Lisa Winchell is coming. She's doing a, a weekend Friday night and Saturday created in his image. And it's a, a training for counseling and temperaments and spirit-filled. And it's really a good training. It includes your lunch. But to, uh, it's a deadline to register is tomorrow. So if you'd like to come be a part of that, it's going to be here Friday and Saturday, but you have to register online because you have to take the test ahead of time. All right? So you have something real quick? Okay. 60, 60, oh, you use my microphone? Whoa, man. I don't know if I'm going to use my microphone. I don't, I don't really okay, need it. Go ahead. Um, I just, I'm sorry. No, I don't need it. Um, I just want to share, like, the thing about 
this conference this weekend, one of the things is it helps you to see yourself and who you are. Because there's so many things and needs that we have in ourselves, and we try to compare ourselves to other people, and we can't figure out why they, they can't get met that way. And it helps us to understand ourselves and why we're there. And we don't, it helped me to relieve myself from comparing guilt, shame, you know, for, I'm, I'm a compulsive sanguine, which nobody knows what that means. I need a lot of people, you know, obviously most people that know me, a lot of, of attention. You know, um, but anyways, I started to feel guilty and shameful about that. It's like, what's wrong with me? There's something wrong with me. And I found out that's part of who I am. And that's what really helped with this particular thing. And Abby prayed for me tonight. I haven't been able to breathe through my nose all day long, and I can breathe through my nose. <laughs> I haven't had time to verify it, but the coach, I believe on public TV, gave yeah, Jesus yeah, Christ. I, I heard you heard that one too. Yeah. Okay, so the coach, I can say it then. Because uh, sometimes you read things on Facebook and you better verify it, but I didn't have time to. Um, okay, so the coach also said he gave credit all to Jesus. So it, it stopped at the top and all the way down to the players. I watched them last night. <laughs> okay, sorry. Everybody stay healthy. In Jesus' name. <laughs> I have to do too many radio shows to be sick. Um, okay, real quick. So that's this weekend. Uh, deadline to register tomorrow. And we have it on the front Facebook page. Or you can see us tonight. We'd love to have you come and, and be a part of this training. Also, the last opportunity to sign up if you're coming to the Todd White training, um, Power and Love the end of the month, we're going to Orlando. We've got an Airbnb house, big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. And, um, and, but you do need to register for the conference. And so, you know, that's in February, the, the last of February. I think it's February 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. It's just gone up. You have to look, you have to register online. It was 55 for the whole time. Now I think it's 70, but it's 25 for one session if you don't register for the whole time. So it's better to register even if you can't go to all of it. But to sign up for the house, I have a sign-up sheet on that table right there. So please put your name on there if you'd like to come and do that. And the last thing, a real quick announcement is um, third Thursday, which is coming up, this coming, not this Thursday, but next, we're starting just on third Thursdays. We've asked fathers in the region to come and speak into people's lives who want to go deeper, who co feel called to leadership not just here, but in the region, you know that you have to go deeper. And so it's, it's going to be a really good time to ask some of the key people in our region to come and speak. They're going to share. They're going to have a Q&A time. It's going to be 7 to 9. It won't be a super late night, but it's going to be every month, third Thursday. And we've got some amazing people coming in. So it, this first one is with Dale Schlafer, and I'd love to have you come if you feel called to be a part of that. Um, so I'll tell you more about it. There's things on the bulletin board. The bulletin board by the bathroom, I, I, it's my dream board. And it's, it's not all my dreams, but uh, it's God, I believe God's breathing on some of those dreams. And some of you are supposed to be a part of it. So if, if you have to go potty, just go and look at the bulletin board too. And, uh, and don't get overwhelmed. You can ask questions. I was like, I, I didn't put everything up because I'm like, I'm, Lord, we're going to overwhelm them if I put all of these up here. So it's good. Um, thank you so much to the folks who brought food, Cindy, for bringing the food, and Pastor Carlos and Alessandra for helping cook, and, and Jody, oh, the ribs were awesome. Thank you, thank you. Um, if you guys would help, though, since we don't have an assigned person to clean up, if you're here, it just, just make sure you clean up at least the mess around you. That would really help so that we can keep this place taken care of well and stewarded well. And so, um, and, and speaking of that, we have the opportunity to give. Yay, God. <laughs> so, Lord, I thank you for the front. I thank you that this is your place where we can come from different backgrounds, different streams, different fellowships. We can come, um, those who are 30 years old in Jesus and those who are brand new in Jesus and those who are just coming to know you, and we can lift up your name. I thank you for the freedom that's in this house, God. I thank you, Lord, that, that you have called us to come together to see our region shifted and changed. I thank you that from this place that you launch out uh, world changers from the, to the nations. Lord, I thank you. And cover Kristen right now. And cover Kimberly right now, Lord, as they're out and about in, in Africa, Father, and in New Guinea. Thank you, Jesus. And Jason in Australia, thank you, Father, for your covering and your protection and for every need to be met. Every need. We call in provision in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 
it's easy if you can go to your phone, just go to the front.info. It's super easy. If I can do it, you can do it to give that way. Or the cards on the back of the chair. Or if you have a check, you can make it out to the front. And I just want to say thank you. And you guys who have given, um, we're working, you know, when the, the frontier went down and the 911 wasn't working and all of that, it affected a lot of the computer stuff. So things are a little behind, but this week you're going to get your thank you receipt and card and fun picture, our family picture in the mail and all that too. So, um, so again, thank you for, for helping out. And you guys want to pass those around? All right. You ready? Why don't you get your cute husband over here and come, come pray for your wife? All right? We'll do that. I love you, Carrie. My favorite preacher. All right. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word that's about to go forth. We thank you for this time of worship that we have to sit in your presence, God. We thank you that even though we stopped to make announcements and uh, take up an offering, God, that your presence is still here, Lord, that it doesn't ruin the atmosphere, but it just prepares, God, for what you're wanting to do, because worship is not about music, but it's about giving our lives to you. So, Father, we thank you for this vessel that is standing before us. We thank you for your word that's going to go forth. Let it pierce every one of our hearts, God. Let it change us and make us into your image and encourage us to go out and be on fire for you, Lord, so that the people outside of these doors can hear the words that you're speaking into our lives. We love you, Lord. Thank you for setting us free. Let freedom reign in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I got blessed. Blessed. Yes, ma'am. I'm excited about what Jesus is fixing to do. I've like felt this stirring today, and it kind of felt like anxiety, but I knew it was a Lord. I don't know. Sometimes I can just like slightly discern the difference, but I'm like, man. But the crazy thing is, is like I feel like I have things leased together. So like, I think He thinks it's funny, you know? He's like, all right, it's gonna be good because it's definitely not gonna be you because I got nothing. Uh, literally, you sh I won't even show you my notes. You'd be like, oh my gosh, what is gonna happen? But I, I want to take a minute, a uh, few minutes, to, to share with you guys about um, an outreach that's coming up on the 14th. Um, so we're going to be love blitz in the city with a bunch of roses. And um, here, here's the thing is, is like we just want to be able to show the radical love of Jesus in a practical way that meets people right where they're at. You know, there, there's just something very disarming about walking up to somebody, it breaks all like that awkward barrier of how do I start a conversation with someone that I don't even know? Because you're like, do you want to, it's Valentine's Day and it's like, do you want a free rose? You know? And the majority of people are like, free? Like, for me, like, what? You know? And it just gives you this opportunity to begin to hear what the Lord might say to them. Okay? I love this. My mom likens uh, hearing from the Lord, kind of like pulling from a tissue box. You know, you don't really know how many tissues are in there until you start pulling, right? And sometimes when we open our mouth to say, hey, Jesus loves you. He's got a great plan for your life. Next thing you know, you hear him say something about their children and something about what he's wanting to, their, them to do about their workplace. And he starts giving you words for the person that's in front of you, right? No pressure, if there's only one tissue, give them one, right? Sometimes we're like, we feel like we have to have this epic moment. And it's about being obedient to the word of the Lord that he's spoken to you, okay? If we go out there with the agenda that every person that gets a rose has to say a prayer on the spot, they can smell the agenda. They might say your prayer, but they might walk away not saved. You know, I want to see Jesus be Lord of people's lives, not just get them to say a prayer so I can feel good about my spirit evangelism as a Christian. You know, I really want to be able to discern what the word of the Lord is to the person in front of me. You know, do you want them to get to that place where they're ready to make Jesus Lord? Yes. Do we want to see healings and deliverance and salvations on the spot? Yes. But you know what we've seen more often than not is this consistency of, I see you guys every year, you keep coming. And then their life begin to change because they begin to wonder what would pursue them like that. 
there are people sitting in this room that that's their testimony from just a simple yes of, hey, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out once a month and prayer walk. I'm going to go out and we're going to give roses on Valentine's Day. We're going to go out and give candy bouquets on, on Halloween. It's simple, so simple, right? And I think sometimes we make evangelism really complicated. Like, I almost don't even want to tell you that it's evangelism because then you'll freak out and you won't come. Right? It's not evangelism. <laughs> it is evangelism. But it, the evangelism is nothing more than sharing life with people, demonstrating the radical love of Jesus, and letting the Holy Spirit do the rest. It ain't on you. It's not on you. Take the pressure off. Take the pressure off and just go and be obedient. So many times I'm like, did anything just happen? You know, I'm like, oh, we went out prayer walking Friday night. And just this sense again of, of God, this shouldn't work, right? Like going out, praying for a few hours on 14th Street once a month shouldn't change anything. Like it really, it really shouldn't. You know, a couple people walking up and down 14th Street once a month for the last seven years Shouldn't, shouldn't really do anything. Like, it's kind of crazy that we, you would think that that would change anything, that that would do anything. But the goal wasn't just to see change. The goal was to obey what the Lord had said. Okay? Because Jesus didn't desire change, so he loved us. He loved us, and then we changed. Do you see the difference? His motive is love, and it's not conditioned on change. And so when we go out and we agree with what the Lord has to say about our region and the person that he put in front of us, our goal cannot be change. Our motive has to be love. It has to be love. Otherwise, you have an agenda. And if you feel like you're failing, you're going to, like, panic. You know? And the person in front of you can feel like, Oh, they think they're failing because they're not getting anywhere with me. They can sense it. They can smell the agenda. When we go out without even our Christian agenda, the world is confused. Right? But it creates a mystery that draws them to Jesus. There's a mystery that draws us to Jesus. You kind of go, why, does he, why did he choose me? Why does he love me? Why does he pursue me? Because you know yourself really good, and you're like, uh, I ain't worth all that. Right? You can see the places where you've failed him time and time again, and yet his faithful love endures in your life. There's never going to be a moment that you turn around and you realize Jesus isn't there. That he's no longer pursuing the trust and confidence of your heart. It's not going to happen. And so that's the spirit that we get to go out in pressure off, right? Asking the Lord to tune our ears into what it is that he's saying, walking in a spirit of love, and just seeing what he's going to do, you know? And so when we went out on Friday, I'm just like, God, here we are again. This shouldn't do anything, but this is what you said to do, so we're here. We're here. <laughs> And I love it because you watched families get encountered with the love of Jesus as we were out there. You know, people that, that you know, we've been, been going after for, for a couple years now, you know. And they're still talking, yeah, I'm ready, I'll get, I'm, I'm ready, I'll give you a call this week. And so, Lord, we agree that this is the week that they will call, that this is the week that they will awaken to righteousness and sin not. Because, God, we know from a place of how much we stink and how much we think we suck, we cannot change. It is only from the awareness of who we are gifted that we can actually make that transition. So, Father, I release grace over them right now to change. That grace to embrace your grace. In Jesus' name. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. There are people in this room that he's done it for. And he's going to do it again. We haven't seen anything yet. No eye has seen or ear heard what he has prepared. Whew. 
Ah, he's God. He wants us to be in awe of him and what he longs to do. And so many times we're more enamored with what darkness is doing than what we are with the kingdom of light is up to. You know, the, the, the kingdom of darkness is like gossip on our lips so often where we just can't stop talking about how bad it is. And God is just looking for some people that will agree with his heart to see his kingdom come. And I heard the Lord say tonight that there's a yes in this room that will change this region. There's a yes that's represented in this room that will change this region. It will. It's already begun. It's happening as we speak. And so that's the, that's the what we do, you know, and that's what we're inviting you to do. Now let me give you the dates and times, right? <laughs> let me remember to get practical. So we are going to buy at least 500 single roses, and we're going to make about 18 to 20 bouquets of flowers to bring out. Um, so um, that's a lot of thorns to peel off roses and a lot of flowers that need to be prepped um, it's a lot of, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. Like, it's a good, like, 16 hours of work with, with a group of volunteers. No joke. Anybody, raise your hand if you've come prep flowers with us before in this room. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. But it's so much fun. It's so good. And so, yeah, so we're going to meet here and, on Tuesday the 13th to try to prep all the flowers before the 14th, right? This is the first year that we've tried to get everything done before the 14th because here's my thought process right we're spending like over a thousand dollars on flowers and then you, we get a group of volunteers together in the evening but volunteers i i don't it's good hey that's a carryism you can go ahead and write that down put it in my dictionary later i don't know what just happened jesus help me oh lord have mercy Volunteers. I'm going to get all you volunteers. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So we would get everyone together normally on, on Valentine's in the evening, and you, we only have about two hours on the streets before, you know, it's usually a, a weekday, and then people are going to need to, you know, go home and go to sleep. Not everyone can stay out to 2 in the morning, although sometimes people do, you know. And so I was just like, man, wouldn't it be great if we had everything done ahead of time and then anybody who's available all day on the 14th, you know, as you drive to work and you think about the person that you see at the bus stop, you know, waiting to go to work, um, you know, the mall that you pass that you've got to stop into, like, if we can just be intentional to love the one in front of us on Valentine's Day. And so people can come. We're going to have people be able to come on Tuesday and, and get roses um, I just kind of need a heads up uh, if you think you want some roses to take out during the day. Um, this is probably going to be a logistical nightmare, and I accept. <laughs> it's going to be good, but it's probably going to be a logistical. Li oh, Jesus. I promise you, y'all. <laughs> I'm good. Oh, help me, Lord. But, <laughs> oh, man. So, we want to get as many roses in people's hands during the day to give out. So my goal is to maybe give out at least 200 roses during the day, and then we'll still have 300 single roses to get, give out that evening. So um, Tuesday, we're prepping flowers. We're meeting here at 9 a.m. We'll be here till, till 6 o'clock. And then we are, I, again, If just message me on Facebook. Hit me up. Get my number tonight um, if you're wanting to, to come. Um, if you're wanting to give roses out during the day so that we can connect with you, get you roses. And then we're going to go out as a group. Anybody who's wanting to, like, split up and just all blitz the city at one time. We have certain bars that we hit every Valentine's Day. So much fun to go in there and just love on the people in the bars. Um, and so we'll just invite you to come out. There'll be team leaders that know that area of the city. So you're not going to be sent somewhere that you're totally unfamiliar with. <laughs> not knowing uh, what you're doing. We'll do an orientation uh, beforehand. So that'll be the 14th at 6.30. We'll do orientation. We'll hit the streets by 7.15. Teams will be back by 9.15.
this is, this is what I say, but it never really works like this. 915, if you know anything about organizing events. And, um, and then we're hoping to have a debrief at the very end, share testimonies, and everyone will be done by 10. So that's, that's the goal. Um, there is a Facebook event, event online that you can go look at um, on my Facebook page, Carrie Moran Hamblin, and you can check out more about the, the details. You can message me there if you want to uh, be involved, want to get some roses to give out. Does that make any sense? Yeah. See, <laughs> you just want to hear volunteers again. That's all anyone's going to remember from tonight. That's it. I ruined it. So, all right, Holy Spirit, you know the end from the beginning, and I don't with this word. So I just need you to show me your divine order, Lord, and what it is. God, that, that you're wanting to release and what you're wanting to say first, Lord. I ask, Lord, for, for ears to hear. God, for, for, for my heart to be ready to encounter and receive your word. God, I'm not just after some things that I can quote and post on Facebook later. <laughs> Lord, I'm, I'm after your Holy Spirit working and transforming me more fully and more rightly into the knowledge and image of my creator. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to have your way. We give you room. We give you room. It's your word. I'm just coffee catting. It's your word. It's your word. And it has the power to do what you said it would. It's alive and active. As soon as it gets released, it's working on me. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. So I felt like um, I'm going to start with just kind of a corporate ministry word first. I felt like that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, and so I had this word when, when I was in prayer today. Some people were sharing um, some prayer requests on, online and, uh, you know, pertaining to, to marriages and stuff happening. And I felt like the word that I heard was sabotage, um, which is, is like a deliberate attack, right, to keep something from moving forward. Right, and I just I, and I felt like as I was I was hearing that word that it wasn't just the few prayer requests that I was fielding today, um, but but that it was a corporate word that there's places where people in here feel feeling like you have a word or or you find they're like are trying to move ahead, and it's like every step that you've taken to move ahead. It's like things are getting cut out from underneath you. You go to do one thing and you turn around and something's undone. Um, in a funny sense, it's like cleaning your house and having a two-year-old, you know, um, where it's like, it feels, just feels like uh, sabotage, where you just like clean one thing, you turn around and poof, like everything else is, is, is out of order again. And I just, I just feel like there's, there's multiple people in here that identify with that where it just feels like frustration at every turn, you know, where, where the enemy is trying to, to sabotage, you know, and, and his goal is discouragement, so you'll quit, right? But, but here, here's the, the amazing thing, is that the opposite is true, is that what is coming against you is going to be used for your encouragement and for the fortification and building of your faith that your confidence will in the Lord will not fail in this season and in this place, but just like Abraham, it's going to grow in the opposition. It's going to grow in, in the opposition, and you will overcome. You will overcome. You will overcome. So, Holy Spirit, I ask right now for a release of your encouragement, Lord, for a release of your encouragement that you would come, Lord, and be the one that's in the midst of the trial with us, holding us fast. Because we know if you're not present, we will fail. But Lord, we look to you. You are our strength. 
You are our guide. And Lord, I just thank you, God, that the, the, the weapon that's been formed against us shall not prosper. It shall not prosper. In fact, it's going to backfire on the enemy. And just like, you know, it's like the very thing that's been formed against you is going to be the very thing that ends up bringing you deliverance. It's going to be the very thing. The enemy is actually equipping you to overcome right now. He's actually equipping you to overcome. And so, Lord, I ask for hope to arise. Lord, where they're battle weary for you to bring encouragement right now by your spirit. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. We ask that you would come. Shift, God. Shift the perspective that we have, Lord, in the trial and in the tribulation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the beginning portion of the scripture, I felt like the Lord laid on my heart for tonight. Um, I felt like went along um, with this. It's just good. I love the word. That's so good. So it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 3, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. I think so many times, like, we read through, and um, we're just, it's just familiar, you know? And sometimes we need to slow our roll when, when we're reading the word. He is the father of compassion. He's the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Ah. So it's like the trials aren't fun, but when you show up and you have the comforter present, it changes everything. And then that comforter coming in and comforting you is actually equipping you to be a comforter in someone else's life when they're going through it. He's training us through his attributes how to relate to him and then how to, to, to know him as that in our own life and then be able to exhibit that same quality to those around us. Verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ overflowed into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. That one's not as fun, right? Like, give me the comfort, you keep the suffering. <laughs> But there, we have been invited in to this place where we get to identify with Jesus in his suffering. If Jesus didn't suffer, none of us would be here. This would be irrelevant. Yeah. There's something that transpires in the suffering that doesn't take place in the comfort. See, God didn't promise in this gospel when we call on the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved, he didn't say we would be exempt from trials and tribulations. He actually said the exact opposite. He didn't promise us a life of comfort. He promised us a comforter. So that there's one that, that can identify with us in our weakness. There is one who is submitted to the process that we're going through right now before we ever went through it. And he did it perfectly. And he can fully identify with our human trial and existence. He understands the thoughts that are flying around inside of our head. 
he gets that the struggle that we have in our lives seems so real, but he knows how to overcome, and he will not leave you alone in that. He will be the one that comforts you in the middle of the suffering. There's just too much cuteness. I can't go on. He's going to be with you in the middle of the suffering. We get to suffer with him, right? Doesn't Paul say, hey, I want to share with you in the suffering so as to obtain the power of the resurrection from the dead. There is no resurrection power inside of you without death. We want to live a resurrected life, but we don't want to die. It just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Verse 6, if we are in distress, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings as we suffer. What? I'm going to read that again. That was good. If we are in distress, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Why? Because it produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. There's a patient endurance in the suffering. Verse 7. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Like, there's not really comfort without the suffering. At least not this side of heaven. And he's inviting us both to suffer for him, not suffer our poor choices. You know, I, I not suffer our poor choices. Like he'll, he'll come in and he'll bring healing to our heart, to the, to the areas where we're self-sabotaging. You know, I, I'm walking things out with a few people that it's like they're reaping the, the consequences of self-sabotage. And it's like, six months down the road and so they can't see that that's the seed that they that they they were sowing and so that's the that's what they they got back you know and that's not what i lead with i'm not like well serves you right you know that's not what i tell people that are in that situation no you just you you walk it out with them be like so when did that start how's that working out for you you know and you just kind of you you make it safe for them to face their mistake. We need to feel safe. If we feel powerless, we're never going to look at our failures because you can't handle it, right? None of us are going to take responsibility for something we can't handle. That's why we have car insurance, right? Because you get in a big old accident and it's more money than what you have to pay. So you just call the insurance company because you got someone else to take care of it for you. You want to see a crazy accident? You show up on the scene where neither one of them have insurance, and there's going to be some screaming going down. It wasn't my fault. It's your fault. It's my fault. Why? Because ne neither person on the scene of the accident can afford to take responsibility for it. There's no way to clean up the mess that they just made, right? And that's where we find ourselves in apart from Jesus. We're in a mess, in a debt that's over our head, and we're powerless to clean it up apart from him. And so we can't, when we're feeling powerless and we feel like our poor choices are dominating our life and we're feeling totally controlled by everyone else's poor choices, we can't face it. All we have is self-justification and self-preservation in that moment until we recognize that Jesus paid the price to clean up the mess. And it empowers us to turn and gaze on his faith and then go, yeah, that kind of belongs to me. Let's, yeah, let's work on this. Because he'll clean up the mess with you. He will. And he'll put all your broken pieces back together again. And so the suffering that, that we're invited into in Christ 
isn't the suffering of our of our poor choices you know i think sometimes it's the it can be the suffering of other people's poor choices in our life you know i think it's one of the things that i wrestle with a lot and i'm not sure that i've like arrived at the biblical answer answer but it's like what does it mean to suffer for jesus what is biblical suffering you know like on one hand it's like I don't want to say something is suffering and then just be let the enemy beat me up, you know, and not know how to stand. And then on the other hand, like, I don't, I don't want to, like, shy away from, from the suffering. Is, is suffering for Jesus only when, when someone's chewing me out for my faith? Like, what does it mean to actually suffer for him? And, and here's where I'm currently at with it, you know? I think it's, it's, the, it's what we walk through because it's not yet on earth as it is in heaven. I think biblical suffering is, is as believers standing in the tension and saying, it is not fully yet here on earth as it is in heaven, and I'm enduring some things because I wasn't made for this. I was never meant to walk through and feel some of this trauma and feel these hurts and feel this sickness. I wasn't made for sickness. I wasn't made for disease. I wasn't made for dysfunction. I was made for unbroken intimacy with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as his daughter in a beautiful garden. That's what I was made for. Made to gaze upon him and stand in awe of who he is and worship him all the days of my life effortlessly. That's what I was made for. So I think, I think biblical suffering is us standing in that place of knowing who God is and experiencing something different and choosing to believe, God, you are good. This doesn't change who you are. It's, it's standing in agreement with who God says he is in the face of something that looks totally different. That's just my two cents. That's where I'm at with it, you know? Verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about a hardship we have suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure. I want you guys to hear this, right? Because sometimes there's condemnation that we have when we're in a situation that feels like it's too heavy for us to bear. We're like, oh, why aren't I doing better? Some of the things that I've struggled most with is not being who I thought I would be in a situation. Do you ever you ever think about like if I was in this situation like this is how I'd want to respond right like if I got burned at the stake I'd want to be the person like singing songs of joy to the Lord right but I, sometimes I think I would be the person being like ah oh, this hurts ah you know like it would not be like this glorious moment you know I remember one time I got burnt on this toaster oven it caught on fire I came in from from it was real bright outside and I came in and my eyes like you know it, you it, everything's kind of dim when it's real bright outside and then it's dark in the house. And on top, the toaster oven looked like it was wood. But th some manufacturer thought it was a good idea to have, like, wood-looking contact paper on the top of their toaster oven. That's not, that's not a good idea, you know? Because wood doesn't conduct heat the same way as metal does. So I thought I would grab that toaster oven that had the flame on the inside and pull it out from underneath the cabinet so that the cabinet, you know, like, get it away from anything that catch on fire. And I burnt myself real good. And I said a bad word. And, and my friend was like, and then I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Why did I say that? Why did I say that? And she tried to be like, nah, it's all right. Don't worry. But like, you just burn yourself. It's okay. And I was like, it is not okay. I don't want that to be what comes out of me when I get burned. I was like, what if I'm being burned at the stake and I'm like cussing up a storm? You know, you're like, blankety blank, 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 blank. I love you, Jesus. But that's blankety blank, blank. Like, that doesn't go well. I'm like, I don't want that in me. It's, <laughs> so it's not okay. Like, I don't want to have that, that response. And so sometimes we can feel guilt, right? When we're walking through something and something comes out of us that we didn't want to be in us in that situation. And that's not how we pictured ourselves. And we got, start going, oh, I thought I was stronger than that. And I shouldn't be feeling this. And this shouldn't be that hard. And I want you to hear what other people have walked through, great men of faith, because they said we, have in, um, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. 
They get it. They get it. Verse 9, indeed, our, it, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we may not rely on ourselves, but on God who raised the dead. Man, them got a different perspective of suffering than me. Where they do, they don't see the failing of their strength as personal failure. They see it as opportunity. Oh, they're like, well, now it's got to be God because I ain't got nothing left. You know, and so it's like sometimes when I come to the end of myself, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't be this. Rather than acknowledging the opportunity that God has just positioned me for a miracle. He has just positioned me to see something that only he can do. Right? But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And he has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. Do you hear that? This is like, hey, we've been through this before, and he delivered us. And now we're in it again, and he's fixing to deliver us again. And so I felt like that went along with, with kind of the sabotage word. Um, and just wanting to encourage you guys that it's like, Man, trial and tribulation and hard time, like, that's going to come. It's just going to happen. But we can actually begin to rejoice in it and what it's producing in us. Because it's when we come to the end of ourselves that life in him begins. That's when the good stuff starts coming. If we can see it as such. If we'll stop seeing it as personal failure and start seeing it as opportunity for God to show up and show off and raise some dead, you know? And so I just, I, I wanted to encourage you guys um, with that. So that wasn't even the word, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think the word's that long anyways. So, because I really, really the gist of what I was feeling the Lord, the Lord say uh, we pretty much just sung about it, you know? Catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Oh, when we can really see that God's storyline is greater than ours and we'll abandon our agenda and just fully dive into what he has. That's, that's what it takes. So many times... We just hear someone say, here's what it is to follow Jesus, and we try to abandon everything without a revelation that we're being caught up in a greater story. And it's not working out so well. And so I, I believe what part of what the Lord wants to do is to encounter you with a revelation of who he is that will make you gladly say, I will forsake all for his glory and for his name's sake. It is so much easier to step out of the shackles and shame, out of the awe of our own inability that we're in bondage to when we begin to see God rightly. And I feel like God is looking for agreement on the earth, but it takes actually seeing him. It takes seeing him and, act, and hearing what it is that he's doing and agreeing. He longs for there to be agreement. That's when, when Jose was here teaching on worship, he was saying that's the essence, essence of worship is agreement with, with God, agreement with heaven. And we were singing earlier about, about like the sound of heaven coming. What would that sound like? And I felt like the Lord was like, it would sound like a resounding yes. It would be the sound of our yes going out to the Lord. That it's the sound of agreement when heaven comes. You want me to show you? 
Isaiah 6. I want you to notice that this was in the year King Uzziah died, right? You know, for lack of a better term, the poop just hit the fan. This is not, this is not a good time. You know, people are in mourning. There's, there's uncertainty. There's confusion. Massive leadership change. You know, as far as I understand it, this was the king that, that Isaiah was giving prophetic words to. And speaking into his life, so he probably had some personal relationship with this king as well. But it was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord seated on the throne. High and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. I'm just going to pause. Because, like, Isaiah's whole mandate and what his life became about came out of this encounter and revelation of God. It wasn't just that he heard some sermons and heard about the different spiritual giftings and said, I want to be a prophet. Oh, God, let, yeah, let that be my spiritual gifting, right? This is what I want to do, you know? Like, his whole prophetic gifting and everything was birthed out of this moment that he had with the Lord. So he's like in prayer, and bam, he sees the Lord. And this, this, this God who's saying, you might feel out of control, but I'm still on my throne. And he's bringing a revelation, right, of, of this God who's in control when everything might feel out of control. And he's gazing on this aspect of who God is. This God who's in control. He's seated on his throne. He's like, listen, I am, he, he's showing himself, revealing himself as high and exalted over everything else. Over everything that the nation is experiencing, over all the uncertainty. He's gazing on this aspect of who God is. And he sees that God's train of his robe fills the temple. So I've heard that back in the day, the, the king's robe, his train, as he conquered other kingdoms, he would take the king's robes, right? And he would sew them on to his other robe as a sign of, hey, I've conquered, I'm over this. I'm over all of this. I reign supreme over all of these other kingdoms. And so think about this. If Isaiah is seeing the Lord, he's seeing God who's in control seated on his throne. He's seeing God as being high and exalted above everything else that was worrying him. And all of a sudden he sees God's robe. And the whole temple is filled. He, there's no place that he can look where God's robe of what he says that he rules over is. God's like, I'm in control of all the kingdoms of the earth. Be not afraid. And he sees all the kingdoms of the earth in the robes that are on, is, is attached to God. And it's filled his temple. This is what Isaiah is seeing. Oh, open our eyes, God. Open our eyes, God, to gaze upon the God who's high and exalted. The God who's on his throne. He's, that you're in control. And that you're ruling and reigning, God, over every spirit, over every principality, God, over every kingdom of the earth. You are in control right now. You're in control, God, over Korea. You're in control over Russia. You're in control, God, over, over the Middle East, God, over our nation. You are God. And above him were these seraphs, each with six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. 
And with two, they were flying around. And they're calling to one another. Listen, this is the revelation that the seraphs have, that they're bringing and revealing to Isaiah in this moment. They're crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Not the whole earth one day will be filled with his glory. Right here, right now, you are holy. And the whole earth is filled with your glory. At the sound of their voices, their doorpost and threshold shook. And the temple, it was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. And I lo- live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So Isaiah sees the Lord in his responses, whoa, like who am I? Whoa, God, why would you reveal yourself to me? Don't you know me? Don't you know that I'm a man of unclean lips? Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know that I used to do drugs? Don't you know I used to sell them to people? Don't you know that I've sold my body? Don't you know that I've been sitting in a pew my entire life, but I don't actually believe in you? Then I surround myself with dry, dead religion. I'm consumed by works. God, don't you know me? Don't you see me? That my 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 lips speak your name, but my heart is far from you. Don't you know me, God? But you'd show up. He showed up anyways. And Isaiah was undone. He was undone. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with a tongue from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. All that stuff that you were worried about when I showed up, that you thought separated me, you know, you from my plan, I'm taking care of it. I've taken care of it. Jesus is that coal. And when we see him and we're aware, oh, I've fallen short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we're freely justified in him. We recognize, ah, I fell short. And then he says, that's right, but I'm here to justify you. I'm here to bring you close. said, then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isn't that interesting? This is another example of God referring to himself as a plural. We see it in Genesis, you know. Hey, let us create man in our image. And here again, we see God referring to himself as in us. Who's going to go for us? And listen, Isaiah responds, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. One second he was saying, I'm not worthy. And God makes him worthy and makes him holy, justifies him in his sight. And then the very next moment he's calling, hey, I'm looking for some people. I'm looking for somebody who will go for me. And Isaiah, who no longer has a guilty conscience, who's beholding God and seeing him rightly, who's no longer overwhelmed by what's happening in the day, is able to say, here am I, send me. We want to go for him. We want to go to the dark places. You want to be evangelist? Gaze upon his beauty. Gaze upon who he is. And you won't help but being able to say, here am I. Send me. I promise. I promise. 
Sometimes we're trying to obey the commands of the Lord without gazing upon who he is that's supposed to be compelling us to do his work. And it turns up to be nothing more than works where we're trying to drum up and do what he's called us to do, but apart from the revelation of who he is. Paul's like, the love of Christ compels me. He saw something in Jesus' eye that he could not contain, and it compelled him. He didn't preach the gospel out of obligation. He preached the gospel in response to gazing at Jesus' face, to the revelation of God that he had by being in his presence. Oh, it's so much easier when I actually see him and love him, and I'm moved by him. I don't want my day as a Christian to be controlled any longer by my shoulds, my shoulda, coulda, wouldas, by every sermon I've ever heard, trying to compare my life up to does it measure up. I want to see him and become like him and exhibit him in the earth by being transformed into his likeness, not trying to just modify my behavior. It's, gonna ha- it's happening in the earth right now. This is what the Lord is doing. This is what the Lord is doing. He's shifting things to saying, hey, quit trying to produce the fruit of intimacy with me by trying to do the works apart from me. Quit trying to do what only you can do by the Spirit in your flesh. It's not going to fly. It's not going to fly. There's been a season and a time in the church where in immaturity, he's allowed us to take credit for things and do things in our own strength, but that will not carry us through in the last days. That will not carry us through in what's to come. It's okay as a season, right, as a kid, if your dad's flying you around the living room and you can go, I can fly, I can fly, I can fly, but there's a point in maturity that you need to realize that it was your father that caused you to fly. Because if you don't get that revelation, Cause splat. Cause splat. Right? Because we can't fly apart from him. Apart from him. We need this revelation of how interdependent we are upon his spirit and that it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And so it's like we, we, we saw this happen this week gazing on who God is, and then the the response, like, can you imagine if our worship, you posted about this week, right? If our worship wasn't just singing about someone else's revelation encounter that they had with the Lord, but what if our worship was actually a response to an encounter or a word that he gave us? What if our day was actually out of a response to who he is? Right? Romans 12 is, is talking about, hey, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Some of us are trying to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, but we don't have a revelation of his mercy. Therefore, in view, because of the revelation, because you have gazed upon the mercy of God, it will compel you to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing What if we got in here and our worship was a response to the God that we had been gazing on all week? What if my day was out of that place? Literally, this is is one thing that I'm shifting. It's not just going through my routine. I'm starting with this place of, Father, what revelation of you do I need to meditate on today to live in response to who you are? And I'm just giving him space. I'm meditating on who he is, on his attributes. And then I'm pausing and giving God space to show up and be that in my life. Meditating on him as holy and then giving him room to show up and be holy. So that my day can be out of a response to what he's just done and not my, just my Christian to-do list. And this is what he's wanted to do. So we were, we were, um, I was over at the, at the His Girls this week. And we're just, we're like, oh, diving into some Genesis. Listen, like if you've never studied the first two chapters of Genesis, go get your face rocked off. Okay? 
Here, here's what I mean, right? If you study art throughout history, you can tell what the artists believe by how they painted. Like the Renaissance period, the different periods, you will see the ideologies of the day in their artwork. So the art can reveal the artist. It reveals attributes of who, of who they are, right? And then if you get to know the artist, it also, right, begins to show you things in their art that, they, that you wouldn't necessarily have seen before. Creation is the first revelation of God the earth ever had. In the beginning, God, that's the beginning of beginnings. God is giving us a revelation that he was before all things and he created all things. That our God is creative and that his creation reveals him. He created everything out of his character and nature. He created space, right? And then he fills it with life. Every space God creates, he fills with life. That's why he will not leave you empty and void. That is the attribute of God. If you feel empty and void, if you feel like there's a place that you have longing that can never be satisfied, go meditate on the God who creates space and always fills it with life and begin to receive life from the Lord in that place. So I love Genesis. Because you get revelation of God if you go real slow. Like we've spent six hours on the first like five verses in Genesis. I'm not even kidding you. And we're not bored. So we get there and, and there's some questions. So we're talking. And God starts to reveal himself, right? And all of a sudden I'm like, I begin to realize that, that right within God, there's this attribute of God that reproduces his image. There's an attribute of God that reproduces his image. And he put his image in the garden, male and female. And created them in his likeness. And they're the only things in all the creation that are able to mimic or, or exist in that attribute of his character and nature where they reproduce his image. Oh, God is like, I reproduce my image. I want my image in the earth, and then I'm going to give them my character and nature to be able to reproduce my image in the earth. That's why you exist. You're God's image in the earth. You're God's image in the earth. Isn't that freeing? You were not born of human will or natural descent. You were born of the will of God. In his image. That's why we have kids. Because we just acting like God. Producing his image. Out of the love relationship. This is how it was intended. And so we're gazing on this aspect of who God is. And a light bulb goes off. And one of the girls is just like, whoa, whoa. I just, what? How come I never knew this? How come no one ever told me this? What has happened? Oh my God. Oh, whoa, whoa. People need to know. Do you see what I'm saying? Gazing on the face of God, on his character and nature, right? Being undone. Oh, wow. I never, whoa. We need to go tell some people. That's where evangelism is birthed. Is gazing on his, I, I promise you, if you gaze on him, you will not be able to contain him. You will not be able to contain him. And then we had this authentic moment of worship. Oh, it was so holy. Oh, it was so good. We were, we were gazing on him and the whole room, all the girls were just like in awe of this aspect of who God is, unable to move on. I was almost scared to look at another attribute because I didn't know if I could take more. And we're all just in awe. And, and she was almost like, I'm sorry, I, I'm disrupting or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is worship. This is authentic praise. When we gaze on who he is and then we, our life becomes a natural, like uncontainable. She's like, I want to just like run laps around the room. And I'm like, this is more worship than what some of us have experienced ever in our lives on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday or, or a Monday or Tuesday, all the days of the week. 
you know, because we saw him, we're undone, and in all we worshiped in him. And as, as that happened, there was this peace that settled over the whole room. You get a room full of women completely silent when no one asks them to. That's the spirit of God. But there was this peace, this tangible presence. And, and Dana was just like, can you guys feel that? That is the weighty presence of God. And we sat in it a few minutes longer. And then joy began to bubble up and laughter starts happening. Ah. Uh, that's this is what we're made for. Whew. Right? Because when we actually see him, we can't help but to agree. Where we go, oh yeah, your ways are better than mine where we're not just quoting a scripture, knowing that intellectually it's true, but we're gazing on him, actually seeing him, high and lifted up, seating on a throne, actually seeing him as the one who wanted his image reproduced in the earth, and he actually shared that part of his character and nature with us. And as we gaze on him, there's awe that fills our heart. And there's agreement. Yeah, this is true. And that yeah, this is true turns into, here am I, send me. <sighs> if we just look through the Bible at what agreement has done, right? We can also look and see we're coming out of agreement, what that has done. In the garden, in that moment, they came out of agreement with who God said he was. They had to believe that God was withholding something good for them and that they could actually gain something. They had already been given everything. It was a lie to get them to work for what they already had. And they had to believe a lie about the character and nature of God that says he's withholding something good for me in order to sin. They came out of agreement with God and we're living in part, right, in the fruit of that poor choice. So that's what our lack of agreement, that's what believing a lie can do. When we come into agreement with the, the lies, we're agreeing with darkness and we're empowering darkness in, in our life. We're empowering the kingdom of darkness. Fear is agreeing with lies. Wherever there's fear in our life, it means there's, there's a place that we're agreeing with lies. And we're out of agreement with God. And I believe that God is wanting to win the trust and confidence of our hearts tonight that we would come back fully into agreement with him and trust him. Mary agreed with God. She said, yeah, let it be unto me as you have said. Look at what heavenly agreement birthed. Look at what agreeing with God birthed. God wants to do the same through our lives. That's why God said that there's a yes in this room that, can, that will change this region. Our agreement with who God is is what does that. And then our lives being in response to who he is. Whew, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy good. It's going to be so good. I'm going to wrap up here. I promise. felt like in worship, the Lord said, we are the agreement heaven needs to come. We were praying, let heaven come, let heaven come, you know, and he's like, I'm looking for your agreement. 
and I'm going to send heaven. You know, John the Baptist agreed with what he could not see, and he prepared the way for Jesus. Mary said yes, you know, and we got Jesus. Jesus said yes. <laughs> ah, and we got it all. Oh, that's so good. But I feel like this is what he's looking for tonight. This might be, this is a little hard. I apologize, but I don't because I know his truth is what sets us free, you know? But Luke 17, 32 and 33 is I feel like what the Lord was giving me. You know, he, he's calling us in, right, to, to look at him and see him rightly. But he's also calling us to quit looking back. And uh, he gave me the, the verse, Luke 17, 32 to 32, where it says, remember Lot's wife. So there's this, there's this moment where, where they're being called out of a city. They're being called out of a lifestyle that's about to go down. That, that, that death is about to happen there. And God is like, I'm going to spare your life. And he calls them out. He says, but don't look back. Don't look back. And, and I... In the, the second part of this verse in 33, it's, it says, because whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. And so there's some places where you've been in self-preservation looking at your past, thinking that you're preserving life. And I feel the Spirit of the Lord say, listen, Whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life, you're going to gain it. You're going to gain it. Now, now remember that, that there's an exchange that happens. When we give him our life, we get his life. So it's not just like we, we, we give up everything and we get nothing. But there's this place of we, he, he went all in. And he's asking us to go all in and give him and give him our all tonight. No looking back. No looking back. Back there wants to destroy you. What the life that you thought you had that was worth living will kill you. It'll kill you. And the and the loving word of the Lord is you don't have to look back anymore. There's nothing back there. It's there to steal, kill, and destroy. But there's life going forward. There's life going forward. Don't look back. It's counterintuitive. I know it feels like God's like, uh, can identify. He's like, I know it feels like you're losing everything. I know it feels like you're giving everything up and you can't even see what's coming yet. He's like, but if you will just trust me, trust me, trust me, look into my eyes, see me on the throne tonight, know that I am in control, know that I have your best at heart and come forward, come forward, step out of bondage. Step out of complacency. Step out of the daydreaming about what it used to be. And step into the fullness of life. If you will give up what you thought your life was, you will gain what you never could have believed your life could be. I'm telling you, it's going to be wild. It's going to be great. It's going to be full of him. In my wildest dreams, I could have never imagined God using me and God loving me the way he does. Never. I never thought God would, I would get to do the things that I'm doing. Ever. But his perfect love has come in and cast out fear. And it's like, God, I'm giving you everything. And it looks like I've got nothing in exchange. But, it, but God comes and he fulfills his word and his promises, guys. The verse later on in 2 Corinthians talks about all God's promises are yes and amen. But it specifically says that we're the amen that we're his agreement 
on earth. All of his promises, he's going to do them. They're yes. He doesn't, he's not wavering between, oh, should I do this? Oh, I have a better deal over here. Oh, someone else is wanting to do that now, so I'll just let them do it. Whatever God has willed to happen, whatever God has said would happen, will happen. But we're the amen in the earth. We're the agreement he needs to release his promises. So, Father, I just thank you right now. Jesus, Jesus, I thank you, God. Thank you, God, for calling us out of darkness and more fully into light, into a place of surrender. Lord, I thank you right now for releasing revelation of Jesus. I just want you guys to meditate on who the Lord is. If you don't even know how to do that, ask him. Say, God, I want to see you tonight. Open my eyes. Open my eyes to see you more rightly. Why wait for another moment? Why wait for another encounter? Why wait for another meeting when we can see him more fully and more rightly today? Oh, God, we long to gaze upon you. So I just invite you to get before the Lord gaze upon who he is and give him your yes no more looking back no more looking back if you're needing some people to agree with you in that tonight um, we've got ministry team people that would be happy to to agree with you also to see that come to fruition in your life amen Seated on his throne, he was clothed in glory, exalted high, and the train of his robe. Just circle. 
So I joined and said 